Christ our Savior, green and glorious. or circumstances or situations that I just want to let you know today, enemy, that darkness trembles. Darkness trembles at the name of our Lord. The darkness trembles at the name of Jesus Christ. That Amen. You have no power. You have no authority in this place. And so in the name of Jesus, that darkness trembles in this place. That darkness trembles in this place. And that you have no weapon formed against us that shall prosper in this place. So in the name of Jesus, we're going to lift up just one more song. Just for all of those you've been struggling this week. Make, make sure you just worship your hearts out, your face out. You worship your hearts out. You just give it all to the Lord in this moment, in this time. I don't know what you got to hold back, but let it go. Let, let that enemy know that he's got no chance to hold you back tonight. Because darkness trembles at the name of Jesus Christ. Darkness must flee in the name of Jesus Christ.
Let's give it up for the local good. I hope you guys came ready to have some church tonight. Come on! Uh, we got a full house. Um, hmm. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Let me pray real quick. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ain't moving. I'm not moving. That, that, that little deceiver, the enemy, tries to convince you, you gotta go, you gotta move. I don't have to do anything until, until God tells me to. I'm not here to impress people. I'm not here to put a performance on. I'm more concerned with being obedient than having a production this evening. There's some people carrying some heavy emotional baggage in this place. Some heavy spiritual bondage in this place. There's some people carrying a level of darkness that, if not dealt with tonight, could be in eternal consequences. There's a weight. There's a bounty on your head this evening, whoever that is, whoever I'm speaking to. Whatever that darkness is that's been creeping in on your back door, whatever that voice is that's been speaking in the back of your mind. I just want to speak to that little liar, the devil, right now, that he's got no power to speak in this place, that I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ, that you have no place here. So I, I'm just not going to move too far forward right now, because I'm just kind of waiting for the Lord to, to speak right now. And so somebody in here just, uh, we're, we're going to sing, do it again, just one more time, and just worship for a couple more minutes. And if you got something that maybe... You need to give back to God. Maybe maybe you fell out of love with him. Maybe you have experienced his presence. Maybe you have given your life to him. But you're in a season of dryness. You're in a season of stalemate with him. You're in a season of, of not actually committing your life to the Lord. Or you've allowed the door just a little bit to be creeped back open for the enemy with small compromises in your life. I would hate for you to miss a, a message tonight that could truly have some difference in your life. Because of compromise that's blocking your ability to hear. So if you need to do it again, you need to see God move in your life again. You got something just to get right before the altar. Let's do it at this song and this time. That way the message is planted on a soft heart tonight. And so let's sing this to the Woo! Lord. Come on! If you got something you need to get right, these altars are over. I'm not looking forward yet. Your faithfulness, faithful. 
Y'all are wild out there. You know that? Yeah. yeah! Let's give it up for our worship team. Let's give it up for our worship team. All right, so go ahead and have a seat. Let's, uh, let's get into this time of uh, church and preaching and all that good stuff right here. Hey, anybody here for their first time? Throw a hand up if you're here for the first time. All right, all right. Let's give it up for our first time. Let's up for us. Check it out. My brother right here said, hey, I forgot to bring some to write notes on. I got him one right here. Here you go. So it, it, I always encourage everybody to, to grab a pen and a piece of paper to take notes because... If you're coming just to listen to me preach, you're going to be sadly let down. And so what I'm trying to encourage people to do is take notes, write the addresses down of where we preach out of tonight, write the, you know, the, the scripture down that we talk out of tonight. That way you've got something to study on your own time. Study on your own time. The sermon series that we're going into over the next few weeks is going to be called Conqueror. Everybody say Conqueror. Conqueror. Say it like you really mean it now. Conqueror. That's what I'm talking about. Conqueror. So if you're taking notes, I'll write this down that so we can remember what sermon series that I'm talking out of. Conqueror. 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 The word conqueror. One who overcomes in adversity. The victor. The winner. Champion. Hero. Conqueror. What's up, ladies? How you doing? Yes, you guys. Hey, who called me a squirrel earlier? Yes, yeah, my brother. Good to see you, bro. Okay. <laughs> All right, Conqueror, we are preaching out of Romans 837 this evening. Write that address down. You see, what I'm debating on is if I really want to stay on the stage or not. Like, I feel like this is going to be an active message, so I'm going to get up in y'all's face out here, I think. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's really what I was wrestling with. Now, now I'm down on, like, level playing where I can yell at people, so... Conqueror, Romans 837. If you got tricked into coming, I'm sorry, because <laughs> I'm a mess. Romans 837. Romans 837 says this. Now in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now in all things, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The word conqueror is one who overcomes in adversity. A victor, winner, champion, hero. Romans 8.37 says this. Now in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through him who loved us. This evening, I want to talk about the trap of comparison. 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 So I got a real silly story like sometimes I do. Anybody remember the ranch story? Yeah, I've been tortured with that. Thank you, worship team. Hannah, Hannah sends me a video on the regular of some toddler ranch trying to make me puke. So <laughs> I've got one more personal story I'm going to tell. If you use it against me, it'll get worse. <laughs> kind of a strange story to tell because I got some, some friends here that knew me probably back at this time that's back from Miller. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell one of my my early on stories. And so early on, I'm saying like fourth grade. Don't do any fact check or Wikipedia check on this information because honestly, there's a lot of fuzziness in my past. And so some of those memories just aren't real active, if you know what I'm talking about. But I think it's somewhere around fourth grade. We used to have this event in elementary school, and it was called like track and field day. Anybody have track and field day? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was like a, it was like all out competition, running and throwing. Bait. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It was like, honestly, my most favorite day of the entire year. I looked forward to track and field day. It was like fourth grade, and, you know, you did like baseball toss. You did like uh, 50 yards, 100 yards. You did sprints. You did relays. You did all kinds of craziness. And so, like, if you were to, like, you know, be the man, even in fourth grade, you know what I'm saying, what color ribbon do you think you'd want? Anybody remember that color? The winning color. Yeah, the winning color is blue. If you, if you don't remember, I too. <laughs> That's my favorite color still to this day, 30 years later, right? It's the blue first place ribbon. And so I'm in fourth grade, and like all year, what I'm looking forward to is track and field day. Because not only do you get to like make a name for yourself, but you get to just completely show off to everybody else. And when I was in fourth grade, 
I may not look like it, but I was a fast little dude. Like, I could put some wheels on and get moving. And so, you know, when I was in that grade, I was a hair of an athlete if I'm bragging on myself, okay? At least I thought I was. But the truth was, is like, I absolutely idolized those little blue ribbons. I was taught that those blue ribbons meant that you actually accomplished something, right? Is that fair? That's kind of the system that we use in this country is you get medals or you get trophies or you get attaboys or you get the blue ribbon, as I remember, as first place because you're the best. You're the fastest. And so I remember in fourth grade just being the fastest, getting six blue ribbons once, all six events. I had won the baseball toss. I've run the sprints. I think I even pushed a girl down once. And I just had to say, I had to be honest because there's people back there that probably knew I did that. So I won at all costs, and that's because I was competitive in my bones. Like, I was taught from an early age of being competitive. It was just in my DNA and my fiber who I was. I wanted to be the fastest, smartest, and the best. I just, it absolutely was my, my, my all out goal. All year, I looked forward to this event. Well, I had a best friend, and uh, this best friend and me were equally as fast most of the time. I think, you know, if the record stands accurate, and, I'm, you know, we're, it's being recorded, so I can't lie right now, and, and I don't think you're supposed to do ministry, I'm not sure, but <laughs> if the record stands accurate, like, you know, I was a little bit faster. I usually would beat them by a few steps or so, okay? And so, anyways, uh, my best friend and me were constantly competing against each other, always competing, but yet we called each other best friends. Does anybody relate to that? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's kind of like this idea, like, we act like they're our best friends, really they're our frenemies. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to keep them real close because I'm going to smoke you and make fun of you. You know, but if you're real far away, I can't make fun of you. And so it's kind of like this frenemy idea. You know, I keep those people I like competing with real close to me. That way it can show off when it's time. And so I'm in fourth grade and I'm learning these lessons of the blue ribbon, first place. You know what I'm talking about? Comparison. The trap of comparison started at an early age for me. So we're talking about this story. This is going to probably blow you away a little bit. But... When I was in fourth grade, those blue ribbons also meant that I had, like, supreme quick access to the cutest girl in our grade. Do you know what I'm saying? So it was like a dual prize. Not only did I get the blue ribbon, but also I got the, like, the fast track of talking to the cute girl that all the other guys wanted to talk to. It got me, like, access. Is that too much? Am I being too honest? Am I not allowed to talk no, about that? No, come on, bro. Come anybody. on. So anyways, this blue ribbon, this blue ribbon got me, like ultimate access so I, I got all six blue ribbons that year and I think it was fourth grade and I remember my friend uh, I'm gonna call him Charlie just to be nice and, and Charlie was like moping around and sad and, and I was like yeah look at these ribbons da, 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 look, these are so awesome and I was rubbing it in like a little punk I was and, and so like I got six blue ribbons that year I remember and I remember talking you know in a little circle with all of our friends and the, the cute girl like the one that you know really had a crush on and, and she goes, this is the words that she said in front of me and my friend Charlie, I'll call him. And uh, she said this. I, I had to write it verbatim because it, it flashes in my... She said this. She goes, Brandon, you are the fastest. I'll never forget it. It was fourth grade. <laughs> that didn't mean much to you guys. It meant a lot to me. Like, it was special to me. Like, no, let me try it again. You ready? She said, Brandon, you are the fastest. And I was like... <laughs> And like, really a minute went by and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm just like, teach hey, I'm waving at the teacher or something. Anyway, so, fast forward. <laughs> That's stupid. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Here's the truth. Here's the truth. There's, there's a point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to land this story in a minute, I think. <laughs> or we're just going to go to worship again. One of the two. She said, Brandon, you're the fastest. Those words seared in my heart right at that moment. I was publicly affirmed by the girl that was cute and in front of my best friend, Charlie, who was a friend of me. Right? Let's be real. After that, my life changed quite a bit. I ended up taking off, going to Arizona, and I was separated from all my friends for a long time. Life got crazy. I went through, I literally, I went through hell on earth. Literally. And, and so life got so bad in my life, and I still can replay that story, but life got horrible. I saw things. I, I was tra traumatized. I got PTSD, and it was crazy. But what, what happened is one night things got so bad in my life in Arizona that, that my dad begged me just to get on a Greyhound bus and come back to Missouri. He just begged me. He goes, you're going to be dead like all your other friends if you do not leave now. So I did. 15, 16 years old, 
I get on a Greyhound bus, emancipated from my parents legally, that way I could try to enroll back into school. Long time it went by, fourth grade and I'm 16 years old, a long time it gone by. So I enroll back into school and man, I, I was from the inner city at that point, I was not a good kid, I was, I had bad behavior problems. Like I was, you know, just a bad kid, I'd seen horrible things. And so anyways, uh, I, I get back into, into high school, into Miller High School, just for a couple couple months, a season of my life even, and I'm trying to like take all that horrible stuff that I went through, all the, the drug culture that I had seen, all the people that had died around me that I had seen, all those trauma, and I tried to act like I was this normal high school kid from Southwest Missouri again, okay? And so anyways, I, 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 love, I still love sports, and so this is how the story wraps up. I was not eligible to play sports, but I could practice with the team because they liked the competition, because I was a good basketball player. Okay, so I got to practice with the team, and I remember me and my friend Charlie, okay, I'm saying Charlie to be nice, but me and my friend Charlie, fourth grade till 16 years old, we're at basketball practice one day, and we're sprinting down the court, and it's like we're in fourth grade again, and, and I go up for a board, and, and I go to get the rebound, and, and stand up real quick, stand up real quick, and so, put your hands straight in the air. I went up, I'm him, I wasn't as tall at that time, obviously, but I went up for the board, and when I went up for the board, he undercut me and hit my hip, you know what I'm saying? Boom, and I hit my ankle on the ground, and it, it broke. Boom, right there, it broke. You know what the first thing that came out of Charlie's mouth? You're not the fastest. You ain't fastest now. <laughs> Fourth grade, that happened. Fourth grade. I hadn't talked to him since I left. I hadn't been around him since fourth grade. And he broke my ankle, and he said, you ain't fastest now. Some of us in here need to get over the comparison game. Some of us living off of stories and impressions of the comparison game that have dictated your entire lives how you conduct and handle yourself in situations. Do you know what eventually had to happen? I had to apologize to Charlie. I had to apologize. The only way he was ever gonna be healed, the only way that I ever wouldn't let that torture me was if I went to him and apologized for those sort of impressions. That's not Jesus coming back, that's the parking garage. If you didn't know, it's above us. So, I saw some people looking like they're about to run or something, like the ceiling's falling. <laughs> what kind of church is this? We lied, you ain't in church. You lock the door, I'm kidding. Oh man, I'm all one tonight. The trap of comparison. Somebody spiked my water, I think. <laughs> Romans 8, 37. Now in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want to throw our focus up for this evening. This is the direction I'm going to try to be driving with this silly message that I've started off. <laughs> with the squirrel, right? Yeah, I know. Focus. Focus. That's a strange word for me to be using right now. Focus. Whenever comparison begins, contentment ends. If you need to snap a photo of that, if you want to write it down, I encourage you to do that. There are a few main points that I'm going to drill tonight after some of the silliness and comedy that I bring up. Whenever comparison begins, contentment ends. We are cursed with a social media generation. We compare our behind-the-scenes life with everyone else's highlight reels on social media. It's a quote that's uh, hijacked off a, a little bit of a Stephen Furtick message and a little bit of a Craig Rochelle message, but I combined a little bit of my studies over the last few weeks from information that they were giving me. Whenever comparison begins, contentment ends. We are cursed with a social media generation. We compare our behind-the-scenes life with everyone else's highlight reels on social media. We compare what we see on social media. We compare what the one cute girl said to Brandon in one conversation with the rest of our lives. We compare everything that happens behind the scenes in our life with one event or one picture or one little highlight reel that we see on social media. We take a look and I, I size other guys up online or I size other pre uh, preachers up online or I, I'll size up other ministries online or, or I'll look at, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a meathead so I look at other workout stuff or, or other outfits that people wear or other cars or houses that people drive. But I get like a, a 10 second uh, highlight reel on social media, but I'm comparing what I see on social media. I'm comparing their highlight reels to my entire life. 
We're cursed with this generation of social media because we're constantly comparing and stuck in the, the comparison game with other people's fantasy lives with our real behind-the-scenes life. You know, this is another thing. I'm just going to call some people out tonight on the social media game. I, there's people like... I, I'll be nice. I'll say it happened this week sometime, but it happened tonight twice. Um, so it happened this week a couple times, and somebody walked up, and, and they said, Hey, hey, we just... And no offense if this is you and it wasn't you, but it was a couple other people. But hey, we just became friends recently on Facebook. I had to go back and I looked at my phone. It's like 10 years old. I can't understand who you are based on some of the images that we throw out there on social media. Can I be real tonight? Yeah. There's some of us need to be welcome to Realville. You need to stop living in a fantasy land and you need to get to the real, real deal tonight. You need to stop living in this fantasy land. You need to get to the place where the highlight reels are not the story that you consistently try to tell everybody. Because number one, it's impossible to live up to. It's impossible to live up to. Second Corinthians 10, 12. Second Corinthians 10, 12. Conqueror. Word conqueror. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with another, they are without understanding. Think about that real quick. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Why is it that the enemy wants to try so hard to get you stuck in this plane comparing yourself against other people and, the, and the, the highlight reels of their life? Because it is impossible for you to ever measure up to what you see because you can never become something or someone else that you were not designed to be. We are trying to Come modify on. pieces Come of on. our lives to represent or resemble what the social media life says or looks like. We're trying to, to modify a piece of our lives to try to fit into the expectations of what, of what our culture and society says we should be. But the truth is you will never have any understanding of who you are. Until you stop comparing who you are versus them. You will not understand who you were meant to be. You will not understand who you were called to be. You will not have understanding if you are comparing yourself to other people. There's only one you. There's only one you. Let us pray. Tell me, Father. Father, I appreciate this message you've planted on some people's hearts tonight. I can see the effect and the reaction that it's causing and it's sparking inside a couple of people's hearts. Lord, I pray just that this word is planted on fertile soil this evening. God, I pray that we can begin to just worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I ask you just to do something new in this room. In the name of Jesus Christ, all my believers say. Amen. Amen. Can we open that phone? I'm going to ask you one simple question. Where's my water? No, I'm kidding. It's right here. <laughs> I want to ask you a question tonight. Who or what defines you? Who or what defines you? I want you to write that down. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to think about it this week as we get out of this service in a few minutes. Who or what defines you? Who or what defines your self-worth? Who or what has the biggest impact on how you feel about yourself? Who or what has the biggest impact about your self-worth, the identity, that which you think about yourself when it's nobody else? Not in front of the preacher, not in front of a bunch of church folks where you say the church needs the answer. But who or what is it that has the largest impact on your identity and your self-worth? Who is it that still has the heartstrings on the inside of you? What event that passed many years ago that still has the heartstrings on how you feel about yourself? Who or what defines your self-worth? What has the largest impact on who you think you are and how you feel about yourself? Some of us in here are living for a dad that will never be there for you. Some of us in here are living for a relationship that's long been gone for generations. 
Some of us in here are living for, for an old job or an old past that you can't get back, but you're still stuck in whatever happened back then. You're stuck in that, that moment of time that, that impressed upon your heart and it's, it's held you captive and it, it still has your grip on you at this very moment. You may get peace for a moment, but the season is ridiculed and it's held captive by what happened, the impact that was held on you, that somebody stole your self-worth in fourth grade about blue ribbons to some cute girl. Somebody impacted you. Somebody took something from you that they never had right to take from you. But it is your responsibility this evening. It's your responsibility to let it go finally. It, it has the ability to sneak into your room early in the morning or late on the weekend or after you actually have done something good and it steals your confidence. It steals your, the celebration you should be having because of how your life is going. But for some reason, you're just not content. You're just not happy. No matter what happens, it's like, a, as the Word of God says, it's like a dog that returns to vomit. You keep coming back to feeling empty and broken and hopeless and with no contentment in this life. For whatever reason, you have a good season, but you always come back to this emptiness feeling on the inside of you. And I know that I'm speaking to people because there are tears welling up in this place right now. Whatever reason, you've heard the truth, but you've not really lived the truth. You've not let the truth actually take you and set you free. You're still stuck in blue ribbons in fourth grade and some pretty girl that didn't say it to you. Or some parent that wasn't there or some relationship that failed or some, name it, some high school years that didn't go right or whatever it is that's holding you captive. Maybe it's, your, maybe it's your comparison game where you're at right now. Maybe it's you're in your, your, your high school or your college life or, or you're in your career or you just started a new job and you're continuing co comparing yourself against those people around you. Like if I just had that, if I just had that relationship or if I could just lose 25 more pounds or if I could just stop spending my money, I wouldn't be broke. Or if I could just stop using the needle or if I could quit running back to the bottle because they did it. And we're comparing ourselves against all these other metrics that are not designed to be yours. How do you even base whether or not you're doing good in life? Are you being affirmed by your father or confirmed how bad you're doing by society? How do you measure your self-worth? What defines you this evening? Galatians 1.10. How many verses is that if you're taking notes? Three. Praise God. 90 people. <laughs> I'm on one tonight. Somebody's getting called out. Galatians 1.10. The trap of comparison. Comparison, one who overcomes, reverse, adversary, victor, winner, champion, hero. Romans 8 37 was the first one, 2 Corinthians 10 12 was the second one, the third one is Galatians 1 10. Galatians 1 10 says, For I am now seeking the approval of man or of God. For him I now seek it. The approval of man or of God. Do you ask yourself this question? Or did you just say the prayer one time and thought that was enough? Can I tell you a little nasty secret? The churches globally, we've done such a disservice to so many people. We've done such a disservice acting like the prayer is the fast track to happiness and a fulfillment in a relationship with Christ. We've not taught people to be brutally honest with themselves about actually analyzing themselves under the microscope of the Holy Spirit, doing daily inventory of Christ. Have I really, have I really pleased you with who I am today? It's not about works; it's about honesty. It's about intentions of the heart. When you know better and you willfully do wrong, when you know better and you willfully choose the things that break God, that breaks God's heart. How much did the prayer even mean? That's the disservice I think we've done as a church globally or even locally overall is, you know, we teach this idea that this prayer is this, this, this great thing that brings all this truth and salvation and freedom. And it's true, but that's, that's the first step that we teach that the cross is the finish line too often, but the cross is actually the starting line. It's when the gun goes off and it's when the race begins and you begin doing this sort of inventory and this sort of work. Right. Galatians 1.10 says, for I'm now seeking the approval of man or of God. 
For am I now seeking? It's a question. It's a question. Seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I was trying to please man. I would not be a servant of Christ. Anything, I want you guys to follow me on this. Anything in our lives that, in the comparison realm, I compare myself to Rick and, you know, I like the color of my shirt better or my pants are nicer or whatever, my shoes are better. So anything in the comparison game, anything that makes me feel inferior, inferior, lesser, or superior than Rick, is simple. It's pride. It's pride. But as simple as going to the, the store, driving my car here, I'm comparing my car against others. Right? Are we not stuck in habitual comparison? It's idolatry. You are placing the opinions of how you think about yourself or how man thinks of you over the opinions of God. It's a quiet room in here. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Come on, brother. Praise God. I oh. hope. <laughs> anything, anything that causes you to feel superior or inferior, it's idolatry. It's pride. How do we stop it? How do we get out of the culture that we're stuck in? If that resonates with any of us, I don't know. Like, do you, do you delete social media? What do you do? What are the action steps that you take to correct this? Or do you just numb yourself long enough to forget this message and no change actually happens? Can you recognize where you have limited God in your life based on comparing your life to other people? I look back at the, the fourth grade race with my friend Charlie. And I, the, the ribbons, and I, I, I was superior at that moment. Superior, and I, I made people feel inferior at that moment. I was a fourth grade, I didn't know better, right? But is it any different than the way that we walk into church sometimes and don't say hi to the people that don't look like us? Some brother walks in off the street and we too good to take our time to get out of our own comfort zone and go shake his hand and love him, give him a hug. Is it any different than when you, you drive by that person on the corner and they're throwing up that sign and you're like, they're just buying drugs. Yeah, maybe they need no Jesus, bro. You, we act like we're inferior to some because society's taught us to be this way. Come on, man, preach that. I don't remember seeing that anywhere in the Gospels. Jesus acted that way. You ever notice how your friend circle seems to dress and act a lot like you do? People that don't act or dress like us aren't in our circles. It's pride. It's not the gospel. It's not, it's, not, it's not true love. That's not what love looks like is that our circles are so short and they look just like us. And they, they resemble how, how good we look or how our outfits are or, or the way that we enjoy doing things. Like Our circles are so short with the people that mimic who we are because it makes us feel superior to other people that don't look like us. This is a tough message. It's a hard message. It's a message that requires change in your life drastically. Some, some of you ladies need to go on a makeup fast. So, for real. Some of us brothers need to get off social media and stop contacting the ladies all the time. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Like some of us, some of us actually need, need to like grow up a little bit and start doing the hard decisions in our life. Like some of us need to st start placing things out of our life that cause us to compare all the time. Maybe you need to stop going to the gym for a season, or maybe you need to stop doing what makes you compare yourself to other people all the time. What is it that you must give up that pleases God? Th this life of being a Christian is a sacrifice. It's a discipline daily that you die to yourself. This unicorns and rainbows and fantasy land, Santa Claus in the sky, theology of Christianity, name and claim and stuff is a lie. Amen. This on, life bro. is a burden and it's a burden because you must carry the cross and die to yourself and live for other people. Because you were given that same promise by our creator, his son 
died for you to be here and hear truth this evening. The rest of your life is not going to get just more comfortable and more comfortable. It should be more burdensome and more burdensome because you're going out of your comfort zones consistently to love on other people that don't look like you and don't talk like you. And they need Jesus just like you did before he found you. John 16, 33 says this. How many verses is that? Four. Amen. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Somebody, but take heart. I've overcome the world. John 16, 33. John 16, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me, you may, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. There's no win in the comparison game. You'll never be content when you're comparing where you are. Versus where you think others are. Our focus again was. Whenever comparison begins. Contentment ends. Back to that. As a dog returns to vomit. You go through the seasons of your life. And you're able to ride the roller coaster. On top of the emotional high for a season. Like things are going good. Your friend circle's big. Your bank account looks right. Your jobs are good. And then all of a sudden. No matter. Boom, things come crashing down around you. You emotionally have this, this turmoil. That consistently takes over for you. Whenever comparison begins, contentment ends. No matter how good things truly ever are, you're never really content. You're never really satisfied. You're never really full. You always just want more. Once you get the first like, you want the second like. Once you get the third like, I need 20 likes. Once you get the first platform, you need the next platform. When does it end? When are you truly content? Galatians said it again, 1.10, it says, If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you guys to write this down next. It is our job to be obedient. It's God's job to handle the outcome. Amen. There's too many people taking their outcomes and using it as leverage to wager God to give you specific results in your life. And you stop being obedient when you don't get the results you want. It's our job to be obedient. It's God's job to handle the outcome. It's our job as Christians, as Christ-like people, Christ-like followers, to be obedient. It's God's job to handle the outcome. Some of us need to learn the... The fruit of just being consistent. Yeah. Consistent. Bueno. Somebody being consistent. I got this. Uh, the law of five. It's just law of five. And it's just a stupid little story to be honest with. It'll be playing on memory. So this idea of consistency in your life. That you recognize things tonight that we all can change. I can change some things based on this message. This message is preached from the heart out. Not from my mouth to you. It's processed. It's digested. It's, it's, it's been through my heart. Scrubbed the very inner parts of my spirit. Convicted me. Had me on my knees in prayer. Had me up early. Had me up late. Going over this message. The law of five says this. It's no different than if you decide. You and I in our backyards. In our backyards we've all got this massive tree. And I mean in our spirits. In our lives. We've got this, this huge tree we've got to take down. Okay. And, and too many of us, too many of us look at this huge problem that we've got to change in our lives. And, and we commit to go all in and, and we go out there and we grab the axe. Because after this sermon, you're going to recognize things you need to change. And you're ready to take down that tree to get to the roots and change things. So you grab your axe and you go out there one day and you overestimate the power of just going all out in one day. And you, you hit that tree 20 times tomorrow. You wear yourself out and throw it down and you go back to the backyard and you look at that thing and it ain't even moved. Nothing's even changed. 
What I'm trying to convince you of is, is this the law of consistency tonight. This idea that all you have to do is grab that axe and every day go to that tree. Every day commit that you'll go to this tree regardless of the outcome. And you're going to take your axe and you're going to hit that thing five times as hard as you can. Two. Here's three. Here's four. Here's five. And you look at that problem, that tree in your life, that burden in your life, that thing that, that continues to rob your consistency, that failed marriage, that failed relationship, that failed job, that lost whatever it is. The death of a loved one, whatever it is that continues to rob your, your contentment, whatever it is that the enemy continues to steal your, your gratefulness and your, your contentment away from, all you have to do is, is say, I commit this consistency, God. I'm going to give you consistency. Regardless if this tree, the problem falls, I'm going to grab my axe every day and I'm going to go one and two and three and four. And five, and I'm going to put my axe down, I'm going to go to bed, and I'm going to give the results to God. I'm going to give the outcome to God. I'm not going to judge my life based on the tree or the problem falling. I'm going to judge my life on the tree or my life and my consistency based on what my Father says. Just get up and do it again. And I'll be faithful in the little. I'll be faithful in the much. And so I get up every day, and I grab that axe, and I'm like, one. And it's two. And it's three. Because if you would have asked some people that knew me back in fourth grade what I'd be doing, or, or if you would ask them, the people that knew me in, in ninth or tenth grade when I was a complete a horrible human being, they would have never said that that tree would have fell in my life. They said, in fact, y'all, I told you my music teacher story. The one I was told that you'll always be trailer trash. That's what they told me, that I'd always be trailer trash, that I'd always be a drug addict, that I'd always be broken, that he'll always be incarcerated. Well, he's just from that family. Don't you know his dad? Or he didn't even know his dad. That's what they said. But what I, what I decided is that once God came down and he changed my heart, I grabbed that axe and I said, no matter what, if I never change the opinions of people, if I never give the marriage back, if I never get my children back, if I never make another thing out of my life, I'm not giving up. I'm being consistent. I'm grabbing that axe and I'm going one, two, three, four. And it's so yeah. funny about chopping the tree down. When I'm so busy hitting that thing every day, I'm not busy looking at you and wondering why my life doesn't look like yours. When I'm more busy chopping down my own problems and giving it to God every day, my father's pleased with me. My father's pleased with me. And so there's some of us that need to start being consistent in this place and stop giving up every time the tree doesn't fall over. Well, let's get the worship team back up here. We overestimate what we can do in one day, family. Listen, we overestimate what we can do in one day, but we underestimate the impact that many days collectively have. We overestimate what the, the results that we can get in one day. We all want the miracle pill to lose 20 pounds. We all want to do the Ponzi scheme to get rich quick. You know what I'm talking about? You know how many times a week somebody comes to me like, hey bro, you gotta check this out. We got this new powder, this new, this new protein. You get rich, bro. Just tell all your crowd about it and you'll make tons of money. Everybody wants to get rich quick. Everybody wants to lose weight quick. Everybody wants to do everything overnight. It's a lie. It's a lie. People are selling you pipe dreams based on their lives, their highlight reels. And they want you to compare it to your behind the scenes footage. It takes a steady Eddie, the person that goes to that tree every day, regardless if it falls or not, grabs her axe and says, I don't care, I'm never living another day not being disciplined. I'm never not living another day chopping this tree. I'm never not, I'm never not, I'm never not, I'm going to be consistent. I'm not giving up. I don't care, come hell or high water, what happens in my life, and I'm going to keep going no matter what. The enemy can throw what he wants at me, but I'm not giving in. I'm not going back. Galatians 6, 4 says this. Last verse, and we're going to go to a time of worship. Galatians 6, 4 says this. But let each one test his own work. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in. Come on, follow me. His reason to boast will be. The self alone. When your reason to boast is in yourself alone. And not in your neighbor. It's not the blue ribbon that makes or breaks whether or not you won the race. It's your consistency to grab that axe and keep going after that tree regardless whether or not it falls. It's not what you do when everything's good. It's what you do when your back's against that wall. When it's really time, when it's really a test, what are you really going to do? You're going to grab that axe and you keep chopping that tree? You're going to keep, you're going to keep calling a spade a spade in your life? Or are you going to start sugarcoating things and saying, well, things are tough, so I'm just going to make this one little compromise. I'm just going to make this one little compromise in my life. I used to 
I used to go do a shot now just getting drunk one night. I used to sleep around all the time, but now I'm just going to go date this one girl for a little bit. What is the small compromise that you make in your life to numb yourself from the life that you're not living? You're one decision away from changing your life. You can make the greatest decision of your life tonight. These altars are going to be open, and it's going to be a time for you to respond. If it's time for you to grab your axe and start being consistent, if it's time for you to grab that axe tonight and start just chopping away at that tree regardless of how it feels, regardless of the season you're in, regardless of what people say, regardless of what it looks like around you, as Kate begins strumming, I'm going to keep talking for one more minute, but then these altars are going to be open. Regardless, regardless of what people say around you, these altars are going to be open. We're going to go into a time of worship, and I don't care if you've given your life to the Lord, I don't care if you spent your entire life inside of the church, get real for once. Stop, stop just thinking because you've attended church and paid tithes for a long time that you're all of a sudden safe from this. If you've been victim or slave to a life of comparison, I would be running to these altars because the Word of God says the path is narrow. path is narrow. And if you're not scrubbing your identity and your self-worth against a father, then I'm afraid that you're going to be spending all eternity away from his opinion. The path is narrow. And if you have been stuck in that comparison game, these altars are open and you have a chance to, to pick your axe up and lay your life down for once tonight. These altars are going to be wide open for you. Let's go into a time of worship. Yeah. 